I drive cars for a dealership. It's not a bad gig. I retired a couple of years ago and had to get a part-time job before I died of boredom. There's only so much golf you can play before you want to take your 45 and blow your own brains out. I gotta say, I kind of enjoy it. I've always liked driving, and now I get to drive all sorts of vehicles all over the Midwest. Lots of pretty country out here, plus it gets me out of the house, which makes my wife happy. My granddaughter, Penny, thinks I have the coolest job in the world. She begs my daughter to let her come along sometimes. Usually, if I'm not leaving the state, I'll let her tag along. I buy her ice cream on the way. Don't tell your mom, kiddo. And play some real music. You know, so she gets an education. I know it drives my daughter nuts, but she lets me get away with it. That's a privilege grandpas have. The last trip I took with my granddaughter was about six months ago now. It was a short trip. I was driving up to northern Minnesota to the Duluth area. It was only a few hours there and back, plenty long enough for a seven-year-old girl, but not so long that she'd be fussy by the end of it. My daughter brought Penny over early in the morning and left me a laundry list of what not to do on our trip. <laughs> Penny was already giggling when we got into the car. Now, you're not going to tell your ma if I buy you McDonald's, are you? She shook her head, hiding her smile behind her hands. No, Grandpa. She was lying, of course. That was our game. I'd tell her not to snitch on me, and she'd promise. And then right when we got home, she'd run off to her ma and tell her everything. Then my daughter would pretend to be angry with me. But it was all an act, just a little bit of family fun. Although my daughter does wish I'd stop letting Penny listen to Hell is for Children by Pat Benatar. So Penny and I drove up north, listening to music and chattering away. She does most of the chattering, I do most of the listening. She brought a few new Barbies, and she introduced them all to me in painstaking detail. As she took pictures out of the window with the disposable camera my daughter had given her. It was shaping up to be a perfectly pleasant day. The trip that day was a trade-in, so we were dropping off the car and picking up a different one to take back to the dealership. We made the trade around noon, stopped for lunch at a local diner, and started to make the trip back home. That's when it all went to shit. We were heading back on 35 when we were directed off the highway by some local state troopers. I hadn't been expecting that, because the drive up had been perfectly clear. Well, it turned out that there had been some kind of major accident on the road, and they'd shut down an entire section of the highway. Figures, I muttered, turning off of the exit ramp. Where are we going, Grandpa? Asked Penny. She had a worried look in her eyes as she stared up at me. Penny's a sweet kid, but she takes after her mother. She worries a lot over things that don't matter too much. Any change in the itinerary is bound to make her a little jumpy. I smiled back at her. Don't worry, sweetie, I said, reaching over and ruffling her short black hair with my fingers. We're just going to take a shortcut. I know where we're going. She said, squirming a little in her seat. She tried to give me a smile, but it was painfully fake. Mommy will be mad if we're late. What if I get in trouble? Don't worry about that, I said, taking out my phone. I'll call your ma and tell her you're staying the night with Grandma and me. Would you like that? That changed her frown right quick. <laughs> She asked, bouncing up and down in her seat. Can't imagine she'd miss that for the world. Now hang tight, let me just make a call quick. I dialed my daughter's number and hit send. I waited for the phone to ring on the other end. 
Surprisingly, I heard three short beeps and the line cut. Huh, no service. I glanced around. I'd taken us a ways from the highway onto some back roads. We were surrounded by trees, which was probably interfering with the signal. Well, that's all right. I'll call later. I could see Penny's smile faltering again. So I quickly added, Let's play a game. You remember how to play I Spy? The next 20 minutes were pretty uneventful. Unfortunately, there's only so many times you can listen to a seven-year-old say, I spy something green. It's a tree, Grandpa, it's a tree. Before you get a bit impatient. That's funny. We ought to be out of these woods by now. I grumbled. If I was right, and I'm always right, the road I'd taken would bring us right around Birkins, Minnesota. The road would take us through the very west edge of the Winchester Woods for a few miles. Then we'd be out in the open country again. But we'd been in these trees for far too long now. If I didn't know any better, I'd have thought we had taken a wrong turn. But that was impossible. I knew I'd turned down the right road, and there hadn't been another possible turning point for miles. All right, time to pull out the old GPS. I sighed, pulling over to the side of the road. My wife had made me buy one just in case I got lost. I'd scoffed at that, but at the end of the day, it helped her worry less, so I put up with it. I never thought I'd actually have to use the damn thing. And I was never telling her about this. That was certain. I switched it on and scowled at it. I started to fumble with the buttons. How did I get to the map again? Did I have to hit home first? Or was it... Grandpa, do you want help? Asked Penny. I tried to refrain from glaring at her. No, I can do this myself. Wisely, Penny refrained from offering her help again. I was not about to be showed up by a seven-year-old. I had just figured out how to find the map when Penny spoke again. Grandpa? Just a moment, sweetie, I said, waiting for the map to load. But it wouldn't. I shook it in frustration. For some reason, it couldn't read our location. Grandpa? She said again, a small waver to her voice that made me look up. The road was covered in vines. They stretched across the asphalt, choking the road into submission. They looked thick and were an unnaturally bright shade of green. In all my years in Minnesota, I had never seen a plant that looked like that. What the? There hadn't been anything on the road before. I was sure of it. Was I getting senile already? Where did those come from? Whispered Penny. So, it wasn't my imagination. I don't know. Stay in the car. I unbuckled my seatbelt and opened the door. I felt Penny's little hands gripping my arm before I could get out of the car. Don't go, Grandpa. She said, her eyes glistening with terrified tears that were moments from flooding her cheeks. Don't go outside. Don't leave me in here. I took a moment to hug her close to me. It's okay, Penny. Everything is all right. I'm just going to see what's going on. I need to make sure it's safe to drive the car over these things. Once I know it's safe, I'll come back and we'll go home, okay? It took a while for her to calm down, but finally she did. She nodded into my chest and I pulled away, smiling at her. Remember, don't get out of the car. I'll be right back. With that, I stepped out onto the road. I walked around to the front of the car and looked down at the vines. They were even bigger than they'd looked from the windshield. They were at least as thick as my forearm, some of them bigger. I knelt down to get a closer look. They had spikes growing out of them. Not thorns, but actual spikes. Like those on a cactus. 
As I stared, the vine in front of me shifted ever so slightly. I looked to the left and to the right. The vines disappeared into the forest. I couldn't see where they'd come from, which side of the road they'd started on, where they might end. Once again, the vine shifted. Was something pulling on it? Curious, without thinking, I reached out to touch it. Just then, I heard Penny scream. <whistles> My head whipped up and back towards the car, which brought me face to face with a giant looming vine. It was staring me down like a snake. It even had a mouth, or something like a mouth. Its center was gaping open and filled with spikes. On instinct, I froze. Perhaps if I didn't move, it wouldn't attack me. It swayed back and forth for a moment. Then it began to pull itself inside out, like some kind of sentient prolapse. I could see that the plant's flesh was darker inside, and it had thin purple veins pulsing in its meat. It pulled itself out about six inches, it shuddered a little as it bottomed out. The more shrinking down to some sort of sphincter deep in its gullet. All was still for another moment. My eyes darted for the car, calculating how quickly I'd have to move to get back inside in one piece. Too quick. My eyes shifted back to the vine. It struck. It dove towards me like a kamikaze pilot. I brought my arm up to shield my face. A searing flash of pain accompanied the vine sinking its spikes into my skin. I screamed in pain as it latched onto me as tight as it could. Then it began reversing itself right side out, letting its skin inch forward, pulling the meat of my arm deeper into its gullet. It would rip out a chunk of my flesh at this rate. As it inched forward, pushing more spikes into my arm, my other hand reached into my back pocket. I always keep a knife with me, everywhere I go. Call me paranoid, but it comes in handy more often than not. It's also a good deterrent for wannabe thugs. I gripped the handle tight and brought the blade down on the vine. I used every bit of my strength but it was still difficult to push the blade all the way through the vine. I finally managed it, and once I did, I began sawing back and forth, desperate to get the thing off my arm. With one more wrench, I decapitated the vine. Its body fell to the ground, followed a moment later by its front end, after it released me. My arm was black where it had been struck, and I was missing pieces of my flesh. I could see bone through my wounds. A horrible stench filled the air. I covered my mouth as I gagged. It was coming from the body of the thing I'd just killed. The other vines around me began to stir. I watched as the previously endless vines detached into pieces, like unlocking their lips from a seamless kiss. The vines raised themselves up like cobras, and I knew that I was in deep shit. Just then, a terrible blaring noise blasted against my eardrums. Fuck! I shouted, clasping my hands to my ears. The blaring continued, and I realized that it was the car horn. The vine skittered back, obviously frightened by the noise, and I realized I had my chance. I lurched to my feet and stumbled back to the door. Penny was there in the front seat, her face streaked with tears, but her eyes determined. She was pushing her little hand against the horn with all her strength. Even in the midst of my pain and horror, I was so damn proud of her. Just as smart as her mother. And I tell you plainly, they didn't get that from me. I yanked the door open and slipped inside, pushing Penny into the other seat. I slammed the door, hit the lock, and a moment later we were tearing down the road. I knew that the spikes on the vines were tough, and it was possible that I'd end up puncturing a tire. But we couldn't just sit there and wait for whatever was out there to find its way inside the car. So I kept driving, honking the horn all the while. 
The vines in front of me mostly scurried out of our way, disappearing back into the woods. We drove for a few more minutes before we escaped the trees, the road spitting us back out into the sunshine. I was breathing hard, my arm was throbbing, and I could see that it was starting to swell up. Penny was crying next to me, so hard that she almost couldn't breathe. As calmly as I could, I drove us to the nearest hospital, which fortunately was only a ten minute drive from Birkins. I picked up my granddaughter and walked us both inside as calmly as I could. The nurse at the front desk practically fainted when she saw my arm. By that time, the discoloration had spread nearly to my elbow, and I'd lost function and feeling in my left hand. Everything after that was chaos. A nurse took Penny aside and sat with her while I was rushed from room to room. I called my wife and my daughter and explained the situation as simply as I could. I was hurt. Penny was fine. We were in the Westchester Hospital. Please come get us when convenient. I ended up having to have surgery that day. My arm was necrotic, and there was no saving it. I was just glad it was my left arm. It'd be no good trying to learn to write on my non-dominant hand. I was there a few days, of course. I was lucky that whatever infection I had didn't spread beyond my arm. I was finally cleared to go home. My wife, daughter, and granddaughter had all stayed in town to attend to me. Even after I told them, they could very well wait at home. Penny wouldn't let me out of her sight. She insisted on staying in the hospital with me to make sure I was okay. She didn't tell her mom or grandmother what had happened. She waited to see what I would say. Smart kid. I told them that I'd stopped the car to move a snake off the road and it had bitten me. They both scolded me for being an idiot. Penny didn't say anything at all. I knew nobody would believe me. Most of the time, it's better to tell the truth, but here's what most adults won't admit. Sometimes, lying is just plain better. It's been six months since that incident, and life is pretty much back to normal. Penny comes over to see me more often now. It's like she's afraid that I'll disappear if she's away for too long. My wife fussed over me for the first few weeks, but she's gotten over it now. My daughter teases me about my missing arm, which helps to make it feel more normal somehow. But the other day, my daughter came to visit and I could tell that something was wrong. We started talking and I realized she was fishing for something. So, Dad? She said, setting her coffee cup down. Birkins is having a craft fair. Since it's only a few hours away, I was thinking of driving up that way and taking Penny. What do you think? She could probably tell what I was going to say by the look on my face. Don't. You stay away from that place, Rebecca. I don't want you or Penny going up there. I should have known my story hadn't fooled her. I could never fool Rebecca. Just like her mother, she's too smart for her own good. What happened out there, Dad? I just shook my head. I don't know. But listen to me, bud. Something is out in Birkins, Minnesota. And trust me, you don't want to be within spitting distance of it. <laughs>